Good morning and welcome to this service of worship with the Presbyterian Church on the Hill in Ocean Township, New Jersey. Today is Transfiguration Sunday and it marks a transition in our church year as we shift from the season of Epiphany, the season of light, to the season of Lent, which as you probably know is a season of preparation 40 days before Easter, not counting Sundays. Lent begins this Wednesday, which we know as Ash Wednesday. We won't have an Ash Wednesday service in person or online, but we invite you to do something a little different this year. We invite you to come and stop by the church, pull up to the office door in the circular drive, either at noon or at 5.30 this Wednesday, if you would like to receive the imposition of ashes on your forehead or on the back of your hand. And whether or not you would like to receive ashes, we invite you to come and pick up Lenten devotional materials for all ages. We have materials for children and youth and adults. Again, that's this Wednesday. You can come from 12 to 1 or from 5.30 to 6.30. Just pull up to the drive and I will come out and meet you there at your car. We ask that you wear a mask when you come. You can find a bulletin for this morning's worship service on our church website, right on the homepage, pcoh.church, and that'll help you guide your way through the service and the hymns and the readings and the prayers. You'll also see the words that you need on the screen. Hope you'll join us at 1130 for our fellowship time. But for now, let us prepare ourselves for worship as Elder Randy Stoltz leads us in our call to worship. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Come, let us go to the holy mountain and worship Christ with the disciples. We'll see Christ transformed before us. We'll see our lives transformed before Christ. Come, let us go to the holy mountain and worship the Son of God. The presence of God surrounds us, and yet too often we go about our daily lives oblivious to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit moving in our midst. Let us together confess the ways in which we are blind to God's presence and trust in the one who listens to our prayers. Let us pray together. God of transformation, you make new life where there was old, dazzling light where there were shadows, peace where there was violence friends where there were enemies. We hurry to make monuments and markers instead of standing in awe of your glory. Forgive us, O God, when we stand in the way of your life-changing love. Forgive us when we do not live as people changed by your grace. Call us to the mountain once more. Make us ready to become faithful disciples and send us out to be witnesses of your transformative grace. Amen. Please join me in the responses in bold print. On mountaintops and in valleys, in our homes and in our hearts, 
God knows us better than we know ourselves, and God forgives us when we cannot forgive ourselves. By God's mercy, we are forgiven. By God's mercy, we are made whole. By God's mercy, we are equipped to serve others. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Let us share signs of Christ's peace with one another. After spending four weeks in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, we're going to jump ahead all the way to chapter 9. And to orient us a bit, I'd like to just help us get our bearings um, in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' ministry is mapped out in two phases. We have phase one in chapters one through eight in Galilee that focuses on his power and authority. And then we have the second phase, chapters nine through 16, and those focus on the suffering and persecution of Jesus as he heads toward Jerusalem. So what I'm gonna to read today comes at the end of phase one, beginning of phase two. It's that turning point that links the two phases together like a bridge very similar to what we think about in this church year, as I mentioned in my welcome, that this day of transfiguration links the season of Epiphany and the season of Lent. I'm going to begin with chapter nine of the Gospel of Mark, beginning at verse two. This is just after Jesus has told them that he will die and come back to life. Let us listen again for God's holy word to us. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word transfigured is an interesting word. The Greek word is metamorpho, and it means to transform, literally or figuratively, kind of like the metamorphosis that happens when a caterpillar is transformed into a butterfly. The word is a verb that means to change into another form. In the case of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, it means to match the outside with the reality of the inside. The same thing happened with Moses on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 34, 29, it says, Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. This transfiguration experience that happened with Jesus, Peter, James, and John was kind of a follow-up to that transfiguration that happened years and years earlier to Moses on Mount Sinai. The first time was Moses in the flesh and Jesus in the spirit coming to him. The second time was Jesus in the flesh and Moses coming to him in spirit. Both experiences took place on a mountain. When we have a glorious experience, we call it a mountaintop experience. In both cases, the glory and light of God shone in a way that was beyond explanation. But whatever it was, you could actually see a visible difference. You could see that metamorphosis happen on their face. And for Moses, it was too much. He had to actually wear a veil after that because the glory was all over him and he had to tone it down some. It was different with Jesus and the disciples. In this case, when they experienced the spirit and glory of God, unlike Moses, there's nothing to hide. They can let it burn bright. 
the old hidden way is now obsolete, we can humbly but boldly enter his presence and let our lives shine brighter and brighter as we're made to be more and more like him. Peter wanted to take a picture or a photograph of it instead of being present enough to experience it. He immediately started wanting to do something that would document it. He started saying, okay, let's build three memorials to Elijah and Moses and Jesus. And, and in the middle of while he's saying that, there's this cloud of white light that was enveloping him and everyone else. It was this amazing experience that he could have been present with and just experienced it, but instead he wanted to mark the occasion. And we do the same thing so often when we experience something good, we want to mark it the occasion. But doing that actually means stepping out and away from the occasion. When you hear someone talk about a mountaintop experience, the story often does not include a mountain. You've probably heard the term mountaintop experience to refer to those best or most memorable moments in our lives that stand out among the others. I think of learning how to ride a bike for the first time, or going to school for the first time, or maybe winning an award or a race or a contest. How about driving for the first time without a parent sitting next to you? Getting your first paycheck? Graduating from high school or college? Getting married? The birth of your first child or grandchild? Perhaps you can think of other mountaintop experiences. Chances are you could remember the precise details of that event when you may not be able to remember what you had for lunch. Ask any woman who has given birth and she is likely to tell you the length of her labor and all kinds of other details, vital statistics about the baby's weight and length and first breath without consulting a baby book or journal. Well, in our gospel reading this morning, the three closest disciples to Jesus had a mountaintop experience that did involve hiking up the mountain. It may strike us a, a bit strange for a story. I decided to use some visuals in the video you just saw to give us a sense of how unusual this scene was. Here Jesus is in the midst of his busy ministry, teaching and healing and preaching, and he decides to take his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, up a high mountain. Well, we know that Jesus often tried to slip away from the crowds to pray and to rest and regroup. We saw that in the scripture we read last week in Mark 1. Remember after Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, he made a point to step back, take a break from the usual routine and the crowds and to pray. So that doesn't seem so out of the ordinary, but from here on out, the ordinary ends. You see, once this foursome got to the top of a mountain, a strange scene unfolds and suddenly Jesus is transfigured the video we just watched explains what that means. Transfigure means to change into another form, a transformation, a metamorphosis like that of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. When Jesus is transfigured, it says its outside matched the inside of his reality. You may remember Moses had a similar experience on Mount Sinai when he received the Ten Commandments. His face was shining so much so that he had to wear a veil. So with Jesus, this seems to be a reprise of the mountaintop encounter Moses had with God. But this time, Jesus is the main event. Moses makes a cameo appearance. We read that his clothes and his face were, his face shined like the sun. His clothes were dazzling white. Something unusual. And to get even more strange, uh, another Hebrew hero of the faith joins Moses, the great lawgiver, and that is Elijah, the great prophet. Definitely not what they were expecting. Really, it's the, the bookends of the first and the last great prophets. No wonder Peter, James, and John are overwhelmed and filled with awe, perhaps terrified is a better word, 
Well, of course, terror never stopped Peter from speaking his mind. He's known to do that, usually. And he suggests building three shrines or three buildings to commemorate this event. And just then, the voice, the clouds overshadow them, and a voice from heaven comes and says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. This should sound familiar, because it's the exact words that were coming from the cloud when John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. So here we are, with the same sound coming from heaven at a very pivotal event. But what was really strange is that a cloud came over them, and then they headed down the mountain, and Jesus said, now don't tell anyone what you've seen. Well, who would have believed them anyway? <laughs> who would have believed what they had seen, this event that would mark their lives forever and change the way that they looked at everything from here on out? Their lives would never be the same. Some of you have heard my stories about mountain climbing adventures in Wyoming and in West Virginia. The most scary experience was being evacuated at, from 10,000 feet in Wyoming, Wind River Range, because of high altitude sickness. But that event changed me and changed the way that I look at life and my priorities and just how I think about things. Well, Peter, James, and John had this rare experience that changed the way they saw life as well. It gave him this glimpse of the future beyond their fears for, for one moment. It's as if God pressed fast forward to the end of time and they could see what would happen both in their lives and in other people's lives. On that mountaintop, they got a preview of things to come. And as a result, they would never be the same. Maybe you've had an experience that has changed the way you see your life. Something that just dramatically altered the way that you lived. This is what's happening to these men. And as a result, they wanted to capture that moment in time, have a freeze frame. Peter doesn't want to go back down the mountain. He doesn't want to let go of this moment. He's actually not even fully present. He's already forming a building committee and drawing up blueprints. Who wants to go back down to the mountain where there's heartache and problems and pain? Peter wants to stay there and just sort of capture it all, and memorialize it for all time. Well, I probably don't have to tell you that Life is not lived on the mountaintop. We eventually need to go down to the valley below where the people live, where there is inequality between rich and poor that's growing wider and wider, where people are treated differently based on their heritage and skin color and neighborhood or gender. What are Christians to do? Well, for starters, I would say that we need a vision we need a picture of a preferred future, what we hope to see. Perhaps you're familiar with the last sermon delivered by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He delivered it on April 3rd, 1968, on the eve of his assassination at Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee, the headquarters of the Church of God in Christ the largest African-American Pentecostal denomination in the United States. This is how he concluded his sermon that night. I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. 
I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Wow, what a message. His last sermon before his life ended. Didn't have fear, but had a vision of a preferred future. The promised land that he had seen from the mountain. But he knew that life could not be lived on the mountain. Like that old Amy Grant song, we've got to come down from the mountaintop to the people in the valley below. That's where we live most of our lives. And it's tough coming down off the mountain. It's back to the real world with very real problems in our real lives. Disease and death and divorce and taxes and trauma and traffic. But the good news is that God is with us on the mountaintops and in the valleys of life and in the ordinary plains in between. God is with us when we get up in the morning and when we drive to work or have breakfast with our friends or colleagues. God is with us when we go through our day, our work, our school, our Zoom calls. When we rise up, we go to sleep through all the seasons of life. And now that we get ready to enter another season, from Epiphany to the Mountain of the Transfiguration, on to the Valley of Lent, a time of reflection, self-examination, and repentance, a time to recall our mortality, as the Ash Wednesday liturgy reminds us, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return humbling, sobering. I learned something new this time when studying this passage, and that is it ends with the word dead. You see, Jesus embraced his identity as one who will die and be raised. He signals that the journey of head will be coming when he and his disciples have left the mountain. It's one thing to have had a, a mountaintop high experience with Jesus up in the clouds where everything is brilliant and shiny and perfect, but it's not the be all and end all. Jesus is identifying with Moses and Elijah for the church and for the disciples to realize what their job is in the world, to accompany Jesus to the cross, to take up our crosses in order that we might die to live, that we would be last to be first, that we would put others before ourselves. And so church, let us together listen to God's son. I pray that that listening would not mean staying where we are or staying on the mountain, but that we would listen to the voice of God in our midst, saying, this is my beloved with whom I am well pleased. That voice that leads us all the way to the cross. May we remember that we are on this journey with Jesus as his partners. Amen. We proclaim Jesus Christ with our mouths, in our actions, and through our lives. At this time in our worship, let us offer up our lives to Christ, that in our lives we may be servants of Jesus Christ. As we listen to this offertory music, I invite you to think about how you can offer your life 
to the Lord through your time, your talent, and your treasure. You can do this on our church website, pcoh.church, by looking for the Give button, or you can write a check that you can mail or drop off at the church office. You could bring it when you come on Ash Wednesday. However it is that you decide to give to the Lord, remember that all that we are and all that we have comes from God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, all that we have is yours, and all that we are is yours. In offering these tokens of our lives, may all that we do serve you to the glory of God. May we see opportunities to serve as times when you can shine your light through us and be revealed in the lives who do not know you the lives of those who are in need. Use us, God, and use these gifts to your glory. Amen. At this time in our service, I will lead us in prayer for the world, for the church, for our community and ourselves. And I invite you to join me as we conclude together with the Lord's Prayer. Let us now bow before God. O oh Lord, what a strange time of year. We are lingering between the season of Epiphany and the season of Lent. And we're reminded that we are coming up on a year of living life with this pandemic. We are in that in-between time of the joy of your appearing and the horror of thinking of what lies ahead as you head toward Jerusalem. 
Many of us, oh God, feel like we have just climbed part of a mountain and there is so much left to climb. Our loads are heavy with worry, with regret, with fatigue and illness and despair for some of us. Lead us, Lord, to the top of that mountain where we might be dazzled by your light and lifted by what is divine. Lord, we need a glimpse of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life to guide us through the mix and mess of this life in the valley. Oh Lord, we pray for the people of the world who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. Most names we will never know, but you do. Look with tenderness and mercy upon all who need your care and hold them in your healing light. We give thanks for the good news that unfolds in the world and pray that you would open our eyes and hearts to see the beauty of your face in the faces of our neighbors. Perhaps, O oh God, it is the only transfiguration that we need. And as we enter this new season of the year, draw us into the rhythm as it unfolds. An invitation to explore the corners of our soul, to reflect and to repent if need be, to consider our mortality. Open us to your light, O oh God, that we might see ourselves clearly so that like Peter, James, and John, we may come down from the mountain with all our fears and faults and faith and follow in the footsteps of Jesus as he trod the way of love and justice. And we remember, O oh God, how he taught his first followers among Peter, James, and John to pray using these words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine
story shine on me shine on me shine Jesus shine fill the land with the Father's glory please spirit please set our hearts on fire have been changed. We can't be silent anymore. We have seen the light of the world. So friends, as you go down the mountain from our worship experience today, may the holy cloud of God's presence comfort you. May the divine voice from above encourage you. And may the power of the Holy Spirit transform you. Listen to Christ and follow him. Speak of what you have seen of God's glory. Go and share the radiance of God's love. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.